I say to thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Words taken from today's Holy Gospel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Romulus and Remus were twin brothers who founded the city, the ancient city of Rome. Romulus and Remus were twin boys born to a princess. The father of the twins was Mars, the fierce Roman god of war. The leader of the kingdom where the boys were born was scared that someday Romulus and Remus would overthrow him and would take the throne. So we had the infant boys placed in a basket and put out upon the waters of the Tiber River. He figured that they would soon die. But the boys, Romulus and Remus, were soon found by a female wolf. The she-wolf protected the little boys and even nursed Romulus and Remus. And eventually some shepherds happened across the twins. And one shepherd in particular took the boys home and raised them as his own children. The boys were natural-born leaders and seemed destined to be the founders of a very special city. And as they grew into adulthood, the twins were offered thrones of various existing kingdoms, but they always turned down these crowns because they wanted to found their own city. The twins left and set out to find the perfect spot for their city and kingdom. The twins eventually came to a place along the Tiber River in present-day Italy. They both liked the general area, but each wanted to build the city on a different hill. Romulus wanted the city on top of Palatine Hill, while Remus preferred Aventine Hill. And they agreed to wait for a sign from the gods. Each claimed to have a better sign from the gods, and to have won the right to build on their particular hill. Romulus, according to Roman mythology, went ahead and started building a city around Palatine Hill. However, Remus was jealous and began to make fun of Romulus's city wall. And at one point, Remus even jumped over the wall to show how easy it was to cross. Romulus became angry, and he killed his twin brother, Remus. With Remus dead, Romulus continued the work on his city. He officially founded the city in the year 753 BC, making himself king and naming it Rome, literally after himself. Ancient Rome, therefore, was founded by a pagan and also a murderer who was the son of the god of war. From a very founding, therefore, pagan Rome was polluted with the blood of a horrible fratricide, a brother killing a brother. For over a thousand years, Rome would grow into the most powerful city on earth, heading an empire that surpassed all other worldly kingdoms. Its highly disciplined army, the violence of its war machine was unmatched. And so it was able to spread its social order, its Roman law, it's amazing roadways and infrastructure. And yes, pagan Rome would also spread its false religious ideas and its moral lies. And it spread throughout the known world. Because Rome would embrace religious indifferentism. Where all the false gods were accepted and received various honors. Doesn't matter what religion you are. That was the Roman idea. But towards the middle of the first century A.D., Rome would receive two visitors, two spiritual brothers united mystically as twins in the one true faith. These two great men, these two apostles, became founders of a new Rome, a spiritual empire, a city of God that would be immeasurably and infinitely surpassing the city of man founded by Romulus. It was in Rome that these two spiritual brothers, Saints Peter and Paul, would gloriously finish their race. They allowed violence to be done to themselves as opposed to hurting and killing others. One died by means of being crucified upside down, Saint Peter, and the other died through a privilege of being Roman citizen, St. Paul, by being killed by the sword. 
But their princely blood, their princely blood seeped into the very soil of Rome like a special seed that would eventually germinate into a new Christian civilization, a Christendom that would obtain supernatural gifts and heavenly riches far surpassing any earthly spoils. As Pope St. Leo the Great once wrote, quote, O Rome, these two are the men who brought the light of the gospel of Christ to shine upon thee. These are they by whom thou, Rome, from being the teacher of lies, was turned into the learner of truth, unquote. Yes, St. Peter and St. Paul have made you, O happy Rome, a holy nation a chosen people, a priestly and kingly people. Romulus had built an empire that connected all the people to Rome because all roads lead to Rome. But Peter and Paul would found the church of Rome, having planted this church in their own blood. So the church of Rome becomes the one and only road to heavenly paradise. Oh, how wondrous are the works of divine providence. How spectacular are their designs of the Most High God. As again, Pope Leo the Great observes, Rome, he says, was well suited for doing the work which God had decreed, that the multitude of kingdoms should be bound together under one rule, so that the universal preaching of the gospel should find easier entry into all peoples, since all were governed by the empire of one city, unquote. Now it was true that pagan Rome has been the chief teacher of lies in the past, but with the conversion of Rome under Saints Peter and Paul, Rome becomes the great learner and protector of the gospel of truth. Today we celebrate the external solemnity of Saints Peter and Paul, the founders of the Church of Rome, and ultimately Christian civilization. This is a day when we recognize our home, our capital, our mother. O Felix Roma, O happy Rome, as the famous hymn states, Rejoice, O Rome, for this day thy walls, they, the princely apostles Peter and Paul, did sign and splash with their holy blood. But their blood was the seed of future Christians, and the germinating of a new Christian Rome that would be a light to the nations. This is the day in which we celebrate our identity as Roman Catholics, for one cannot be a true Christian without being Roman. If you're not Roman, you're not Christian. Yes, we believe in one holy Catholic, apostolic, and Roman church, for Rome is truly a mark a characteristic of the one and only Church of Christ. Rome is the very center of the people of God, the people of the new and eternal covenant. The old Jerusalem and the Holy Land has been abandoned, for the synagogue was never meant to be the bride of Christ, but only a bridesmaid. The Church of Rome has been espoused by Christ. Mount Zion has become desolate, while Rome and its seven hills has become the capital of the Christian world, which is the new Israel. The great St. Maximus the Confessor stated that though he was Greek in culture, he was Roman in faith. Though he was Greek in culture, he was Roman in faith. We gather in this church, and we may call ourselves American in many of our ways, American in our culture, in our 4th of July festivities, but we should be Roman in our faith. Roman Catholics through and through. It would be wrong, therefore, to ever label ourselves as American Catholics. No, we are Roman Catholics who happen to live in America. It should be noted that during the challenging time of the Aryan crisis, where the divinity of Christ was denied by many, that crisis, which found more than 95% of bishops were Aryan heretics and apostates, true believers during that time throughout the known world began to refer to themselves as Romans, no matter where they lived. 
so as to distinguish themselves from the apostate Arians. True Christians, therefore, are Roman Catholics, for they have the faith of Rome, which is the faith of Peter and Paul, which is the true apostolic faith. Now, Christians from the East, Christians from the East have often complained about the primacy and supremacy of the Church of Rome, stating that, well, Christ was born in the Middle East. He taught in the Holy Land, not in Rome. This is true. But remember that Christ was also killed in the East, slain in the East, and that all major heresies of old found their source in the East, while Rome alone kept the faith. As the greatest of all scripture scholars, St. Jerome once said, because the East is shattered by the ancient fierce antagonisms of its people, and it's rendering into tiny fragments the undivided and woven tunic of the Lord, and the wolves are destroying Christ's vineyard. Therefore, I have thought it best to turn to the see of Peter in Rome, away with jealousy of Roman preeminence. I follow no one as chief save Christ, but I am joined in communion always with the see of Peter. St. Irenaeus, whose feast day is tomorrow, July 3rd, also emphasizes this wondrous preeminence of the Church of Rome. St. Irenaeus writes, The greatest and most ancient church known to all, founded and organized at Rome by the two most glorious apostles, Peter and Paul, that church, Irenaeus writes, which has the tradition and the faith which comes down to us after having been announced to men by the apostles. For with this church of Rome, he concludes, because of its superior origin, all churches must agree. For in the church of Rome, the faithful everywhere have maintained apostolic tradition. Now, in conclusion, it is said that St. Philip Neri, the great founder of the Oratorian Priests and Brothers, St. Philip Neri used to spend entire nights in prayer on his balcony overlooking the city of Rome with devotion. He loved Rome. Every Christian should. It is also said, too, that St. Jose Maria Escrivá used to make a short prayer with great devotion, regularly simply repeating the term Rome as if it were a prayer. The holy founder of our religious community that I belong to, whose picture is in our vestibule, it is said that he fell to his knees and kissed the ground when he first arrived in Rome. Our founder was in disbelief that the good Lord had brought him to the very center of the Christian world. Now, I'm very aware that things are, shall we say, confused at this moment, even in Rome. In fact, that there has been confusion reigning for years within the Church of Rome. As the Catholic citizens of Rome often state, sometimes Peter seems asleep at the wheel and that the boat of the church is about to capsize. The spirit of Saints Peter and Paul need to be awoken in order that the true Roman faith may be preached and the storm at sea may subside. So that we pray to the good Lord himself who chose Rome from all other places on earth to be the center for his one true church, the new Israel. We pray that he will bring about a resolution to our problems. We pray that the Most High will either bring about a conversion, that the successor of Peter will be shaken out of his stupor, having drunk the wine of a worldly thinking, having been possessed by a foreign spirit, or we pray that the good Lord will simply remove the problem. But with that being stated, let us never lose our love for the Church of Rome, for she is our mother. As one Cardinal Archbishop stated a few decades ago, and I'll end with this, he said, Rome for me means a return to the cradle, a going home, returning to the source, to the heart, to the brain of the church. I've asked the Lord to preserve my faith and loyalty to Rome, which Christ chose to be the seat of the universal pastor, the Pope, unquote. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.